Okay, now I'm really going to confuse you. In my introductory lecture, I used an old slide with dates for a bunch of Egyptian periods. Now I want you to forget those. These are the dates that appear on your matching quiz, and I think these are the dates that you really need to know. The Palette of Narmer is not Old Kingdom, by the way. It's considered pre-dynastic, from the period before the regular dynasties of pharaohs began to be recorded. I've already talked about the Palette of Narmer, so bye-bye to pre-dynastic Egypt. All three of our Old Kingdom works actually date from the Fourth Dynasty. The dates for that, don't write this down, are 2613 to 2494 BC. You will not need to know dates that specific. But do try to remember that pyramids are Old Kingdom. The Old Kingdom is where we're hanging out today. Temples are New Kingdom. So is the odd Amarna period. So is King Tut and our old buddy Hunifer. They'll show up in my last Egypt lecture. I've already talked about the role of pharaohs, especially in the Old Kingdom. They were viewed as at least semi-divine, the embodiment of Horus in life, destined to join with Osiris, Osiris and become fully divine in the afterlife. As the individual responsible for ensuring that Ma'at, remember that? Justice and order prevailed. The Egyptian pharaohs wanted to be seen as eternal, unchanging, unmoved and unmovable, and this shows up in art from the palette of King Narmer all the way through to the coffin of King Tut. Now these statues are both portrayals of 4th dynasty Pharaoh Khafre. There's little dispute about the Sphinx's identity, but not much. It's generally thought that it's Khafre. The statue on the right is not one of your required works, but I'm actually going to use it to review stylistic conventions for portraying pharaohs in sculpture anyway. And it wouldn't surprise me if the college board popped it into an exam and asked you to do the same, because again, it's a very famous work. The Khafre statue is carved from diorite, which is a very hard igneous rock like granite, even harder than graywack, the dark gray sandstone used for the statue of Menkora and his wife on the right. These hard stones were much more difficult to carve, but they were also much more likely to endure. Remember the Egyptians' focus on the eternal. So what was the function of these statues? And by the way, function answers tend to be quite easy when we get to Egypt. Both of these statues were placed in the valley temples that stood adjacent to pyramids. So actually, you know, I just said it was easy, but perhaps it's a little more complicated. They had a dual function. On the one hand, statues were places for the pharaoh's ka, or spirit, to abide after the pharaoh's first physical death. That was one of the reasons why they needed to be made of such enduring stone. You wouldn't want the pharaoh's new body, the house of the ka, to disintegrate. But the statues were also objects of veneration in the temples. Remember, these dead pharaohs have now fully joined the ranks of the gods. So, you've probably figured out that I like to go to sites designed for elementary school students, because so often they make more sense. Here's a quick guide to the pharaoh power suit. I've added one term in red. It's the name for the striped headdress that was one of the symbols of a pharaoh. So let me make just a few added points. The uraeus in the middle of the headdress, or nemes, is actually a rearing cobra with a flared hood. We'll see this more clearly when we get to King Tut. In the Egyptian religion, a cobra guarded the gates of the underworld, warded off the enemies of the royal family, and guided the dead pharaohs on their journey through the underworld. In other words, the pharaoh was a symbol of, excuse me, the cobra was a symbol of the pharaoh's power over life and death. The flail, that's the whip-like thing, and the crook were traditional symbols of Osiris, but they also symbolized the pharaoh's dual role. He was the shepherd of his people, that's what the crook was used for, and he was the punisher of evildoers. Flails were used to whip animals and slaves. Archaeologists actually think, and there's a lot of evidence, that pharaohs did not, that shaved regularly, they did not wear beards, but Osiris wore a beard. And so for their statues and paintings, pharaohs donned false beards to show that they would unite with Osiris in the afterlife. We'll get to Hatshepsut, our female pharaoh, and her beard. And of course, in Egyptian statues, we will see a perfect, vigorous body that communicates strength and power. The elementary school version doesn't quite get that right. That pharaoh looks like he needs a few trips to the gym. 
So here's a side view of Khafre, which reveals still more iconography. It's actually why I went ahead and decided to talk about this image, even though it hasn't received the official College Board blessing. The carved figures that I've circled in red on the throne are Lilena Papyrus. And what do they represent? The United Kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt. We've seen this again in the uh, Palette of King Narmer. This reinforces the notion of permanence. At this point, Egypt has been united for hundreds of years, and it will remain united. This, these symbols also tie Khafre and his successors to Egypt's founding. We also see more clearly that the legs of the throne are a lion's legs. Uh, interesting to note, the back legs are carved in low relief, while the front legs are in higher relief, almost in the round. So from the front, like most Egyptian statues, this would be viewed from the front. The legs would be prominent and would send a message about kingly ferocity and power. On Khafre's neck, really fusing to his body, is the falcon symbol of Horus, Osiris' son, and the godly identity of living pharaohs. They really seem merged. The pharaoh is one with Horus, is about to become one with Osiris. So let's compare the two Egyptian sculptures with Polyclitus' canon. How would you describe the Egyptian use of negative space? There's actually very little negative space in either Egyptian sculpture. Now, it's true that keeping the body compact made the job of carving hard stone much easier. But the highly compact composition of Egyptian sculpture also fits with Egyptian ideology. How? Well, think about it. The Greeks valued agility, movement, grace, all those signs of life, vigorous life on Earth. The Egyptians, by contrast, valued stillness, immobility, unchanging posture, the signs to them of an eternal but also unchanging afterlife. Let me just add a few more stylistic notes. Both statues, and virtually all Egyptian statues, are frontal and bilaterally symmetrical. That is, they are mirror-imaged on a vertical axis. Again, this perfect and really unrealistic symmetry adds to the sense of calmness and permanence that the statue is intended to convey. The Greek statue, by contrast, is really designed to capture life. Uh, let's focus just briefly on the statue that actually is one of your required works. Menkoro was Khafre's son. So what iconic elements do you see in the statue? By the way, I should also add that one of the great pyramids is associated with Menkoro. So back to this statue. We see the symbols of power. The stillness, the young, perfect, muscular body. Menkra's wife's body is rather perfect as well. She's also surprisingly tall. Most statues of Egyptian women depict them as small, even child-sized. The relative height of the woman in the statue has led some scholars to theorize that she may actually have been Menkra's mother rather than his wife, apparently queen mother's outranked wives. The statue is rigidly frontal, as usual, and despite the seemingly affectionate pose, it really doesn't show emotion or movement. The king doesn't even seem to notice his wife is there. Note, too, that both figures follow the convention of putting the left foot forward. This conveys movement toward the afterlife, but otherwise the statue retains the immobility and permanence of Egyptian statuary art. So like the Greeks and long before them, Egyptian artists followed a strict canon of proportions, rules for the relative size of the body. So for example, in order to show the left foot forward, the left leg must be sculpted larger than the right leg. The Egyptian canon of human proportions was a square grid of 18 units that was applied to a drawn standing human figure, allowing it to be reproduced in various sizes, but always anatomically proportionate. We're going to encounter other and different canons of proportion in this class. It's a term you should know. Uh, and note that it conveys interesting information about what any given culture considers proportionate and therefore beautiful. So, why do you think the College Board included the work on the left in its list of images? I'm <laughs> guessing it included the seated scribe to remind us that an awful lot of Egyptian sculpture did not portray pharaohs and that Egyptian artists were able to produce much more naturalistic art when they were not bound by the very strict canons of pharaonic representation. So the work on the right 
is an old College Board favorite that did not make it to the list. Uh, it's T in the hippopotamus hunt. Now, T uh, is portrayed using the various conventions of aristocratic males, known as, uh, in particular, the composite perspective, the muscular body, etc., and that he's much larger than the uh, hunters accompany him. But Notice that the animals and the hunter are much more lively and realistic if you make them out. Also, the figures in relief up above, all the birds and animals uh, up in the trees. So what was the seated scribe's function? Again, it's so easy with Egyptian art, since the answer is almost always the same. This was not intended for human eyes. This was a work that was placed in a tomb. It was there to contain the scribe's ka. By the way, while scribes did not rank with pharaohs, they were important people in Egypt, partly be because they required years of specialized training to learn all those hieroglyphs. Uh, let me add just one more point about technique. Uh, as our Khan Academy scholars noted, the most striking aspect of this sculpture is really the surprisingly expressive face, and that more than anything is created by those elaborate inlaid eyes. They're made from a piece of red-veined white magnetite, so you actually see bloodshot eyes uh, with a piece of slightly uh, truncated rock crystal that's been inserted into them. So the, I think the result is amazingly lifelike. Uh, so is the pot belly, although that may actually have been a symbol of his membership in the upper classes and not a representation of his actual physique. We just don't know. And finally, we do get to pyramids. Past AP question, exams frequently included questions about the earliest pyramids, which were stepped. The first royal tombs, even before the pyramids, were called mastabas. They were succeeded by the step pyramids shown here. Note that the burial chambers were below, not inside the pyramid, and that the architect of the stepped pyramid is the first architect that we know of by name in Mahotep. And alas, that is all I'm going to say about the fascinating development of the earlier pyramids. In a minute, you're going to be watching several clips from History Channel documentary about the pyramids. The entire video is up on Moodle and includes a segment on the stepped pyramid and its predecessors. So, of course, feel free to indulge your curiosity. The Great Pyramids are the only wonders of the ancient world that are still standing. Originally, the pyramids were covered with smooth white limestone, so this is like seeing a modern-day house with the stucking or the brick facing removed. The original pyramids would have shimmered in the sunlight, capped by a pyramidal ben-ben that was probably covered with gold plate. I get frustrated enough trying to teach paintings or sculptures with what are, in effect, slides. It becomes almost impossible to get an impression of architecture this way. So let's turn to a video clip that will give you a panorama of this site, and we'll talk about the function of these extraordinary works. By the end of the clip, you should be able to answer the first basic question about the work, which is, what is its function? This plan of the pyramid complex is also one of your required images. The diagram is actually a little confusing to my mind, since north is not at the top, as we're used to seeing. That's why I circled the directional indicator on the diagram. Once you know which way north is, you should see that the temple complexes uh, that were attached to the pyramids were built to the east of the pyramids facing the sun. At this point, the cult of the sun god, Ray had achieved greater prominence, and the orientation of the temples reflects this. Remember those Old Kingdom statues that we looked at earlier in the lecture? They would have been placed in these temples. Scholars still debate just how the pyramids were constructed, so let's return to the video and get a glimpse of some of the theories. Well, this interior plan of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, that's the largest of the pyramids, is not part of the required images, but I think it's worth a little study. Part of what makes the pyramids so remarkable is that they included rooms at their very center, tombs for the pharaohs and their entry point to the afterlife. The video continues with the glimpse of the interior of this pyramid. If you want to learn more about the other two Great Pyramids, feel free to watch more of the movie on your own. And finally, we get to the weirdest and, to my mind, most wonderful element in this complex, the Sphinx. One last short video clip. At this point, you may have run out of time. But if you haven't, I think today's lesson offers two excellent candidates for comparative analysis. So what do you think? How do the Sphinx and the Lama Sioux compare in terms of our big four, function, content, context, and form? 
And what about the ziggurat topped with a temple, the white, uh, white temple uh, of Uruk and the great pyramids of Giza? In my last lecture for this unit, we'll fast forward through to the New Kingdom, move from pyramids to temples, and encounter one truly bizarre pharaoh and his young, much less bizarre, but much more jewel-encrusted son.